Uh, so I'm J.R. Blair, and um, I'm currently retired and really enjoying that. It's been a lot of fun to just be a volunteer and abdicate all responsibility. Um, but uh, I've been involved uh, with the Mycological Society of San Francisco since the, uh, the mid-80s when I um, uh, uh, came back to the Bay Area after getting a bachelor's degree at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. And uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, uh, Dr. Michael Bug. Uh, he's um, one of the authors of the Audubon, um, uh, Audubon Guide to, um, to Fungi, and he's recently published a um, uh, mushroom, mushrooms of Cascadia. Anyway, he was my professor at Evergreen. Um, and uh, jump ahead to uh, to the mid '90s, and I uh, entered into uh, Dr. Desjardins' uh, lab at San Francisco State. Uh, Dr. Dennis Desjardins is one of the authors of California Mushrooms, uh, which I highly recommend. And uh, I studied uh, fungi associated with Arctostaphylus. So that's uh, Manzanita. I crawled around on my hands and knees for a couple of years, a um, couple of winters. Made about 400 collections of about 135 different species of, of mushrooms that I found there. Uh, so that's, that's my educational background. I uh, was the president of the Mycological Society for a couple of years and uh, also ran the fungus fair uh, for the Mycological Society of San Francisco for about five years, um, besides being uh, president for a couple of years. Um, still active with, uh, with that club. And um, I'll uh, talk a little bit about that at the end of my talk uh, today. So, so some of you, uh, uh, saw my previous talk, I discussed uh, mycorrhizae, uh, which is one of the ecological roles that fungi take. Um, but I'm going to go back to the basics now. So I'm going to talk about uh, lots of different aspects of, of fungi. Uh, getting to the bottom of it all is the title of my talk. And I'll be talking about the habitat ecology and life cycles of fungi. And as a, uh, a subtitle, if you will, uh, we can sort of start off talking about what is a mushroom anyway. So a mushroom is a type of fruiting body. So it, basically it's the reproductive structure of a fungus. Now, most people, when they think of the term mushroom and there are even a lot of people who use the term mushroom, um, they talk about something that has a, a stem and a cap. But there are lots of uh, fruiting bodies that don't have um, uh, either a stem or a cap or both. By the way, um, just so you know, if there's uh, terms in red, that's going to be on the exam. So just you know, pay attention to those. They're important. Uh, so here's some examples of some other types of fruiting bodies, okay? So here we have a, um, uh, here we have a uh, coral mushroom, uh, puffballs, jelly fungus, and over here in the lower left is a, um, uh, a uh, polypore. So these are all fruiting bodies. These are all um, structures that are involved with um, reproduction. More specifically, Oh, I can get my thing to work here. There we go. More specifically, um, the they're involved with the production and dispersal of spores. So a spore uh, technically is a single cell that is capable of cell division. That's the definition of a spore. And they're typically microscopic. Um, just to give you an example, this uh, photo micrograph here of some um, highly pigmented spores that are probably black or, or dark brown spores uh, in mass. Um, it, these are probably about 10 micrometers uh, more or less uh, long. Now, uh, those spores then 
divide into um, cells that are uh, cylindrical in nature and they form chains. And these cells are what we refer to as hyphae. Uh, it turns out that, that all multicellular fungi, so in other words, all fungi that are not considered yeasts, uh, which are single cell, um, and there are some other organisms, such as some slime molds and some other, other organisms like that, that um, are comprised of these chains of, of cells called hyphae. Now, in order to, to see um, these, you also need a, a microscope. So here's another micrograph of, um, of hyphae. I see I have a question. I'm going to see if I can. Uh, oh. Um, are you asking, uh, later on, uh, Carolyn, if I would be able to, to, uh, share my slides, if that's your question, um, the, it, the slideshow is pretty large, so, uh, we would need to figure out a way to do that. But if you're really keen to have my slideshow, we can, uh, talk about that. Uh, I'll give my, uh, email address, uh, later on. So, all right. So, these hyphae, these, these chains of cells, um, will grow and branch into masses of tissue that are, that we are, that are called mycelium. Um, you've probably heard that term before. This is really the business end of the fungus. This is the part of the fungus that's uh, growing in the substrate. And when I say substrate, I, I, might, I mean, you know, could be um, a, a log, could be in the soil, could be uh, in wood chips, um, something like that. So whatever the growth medium is for the fungus. Here's a photograph uh, that I took of some mycelium and you probably recognize that if you turn over a log in the woods or sometimes a uh, you know, piece of plywood or something like that that's in your, uh, in your uh, backyard and you turn it over, you see this, these this white cobwebby mass of material, and that's going to be mycelium. And now mycelia from two different individuals uh, can fuse together, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is mushroom sex. And we'll get back to that a little bit later. Everybody's interested in mushroom sex, uh, of course. Uh, now, at a certain point in this life cycle of the fungus, fruiting bodies are produced. And typically what happens is uh, that uh, pinheads, uh, these, these uh, primordial masses of uh, tissue that we call pinheads uh, are formed. Uh, the hyphae act like channels for the, the uh, movement of, of nutrients such as carbon and uh, nitrogen and other important uh, nutrients that help to create these uh, pinheads. Now here's a photograph of a uh, mushroom kit. Uh, this is, this is uh, uh, a straw-based mushroom kit. You can see the straw in the background. All that white stuff, that's uh, mycelium. Uh, people who grow mushrooms would call that spawn. Um, and then the little pinheads there are um, primordial uh, oyster mushrooms. So those, you can see in the background, some of the um, mushrooms that are starting to get larger. Essentially, what happens is that these pinheads uh, fill with water. So when you see something like this, this uh, cluster of pinheads, and you, you can see some little individuals there. The vast majority of cells are already there at this stage. And um, so they fill with water and expand out into uh, what we know of as a mushroom or a fruity body of some sort. Um, and uh, uh, this is why uh, we have to wait until the rains come for the, the season, why the winter here in California is really the, the best time for mushroom hunting. Um, and in other places such as uh, the, in the Eastern half of, uh, of North America, uh, the best time for hunting uh, mushrooms is in the summer, late summertime when they get their uh, daily rains more or less um, throughout the summer and into the fall. Uh, but again, the uh, 
the point is that the fruiting bodies really depend upon uh, moisture and uh, in the uh, substrate. And then the fruiting bodies produce the spores on fertile surfaces. And so here's some examples of some fertile surfaces. You all are familiar with uh, gills, uh, an unfortunate term, I have to say, because they're not involved with extracting oxygen from water, like fish gills. But somebody thought down the line there that the that the gills are, or that these structures look like fish gills, and therefore that stuck. By the way, I have to tell you that that you know, similar to the way that uh, that um, uh, you know the plant uh, sciences botany works. Um, mycology also have has lots of jargon, and uh, technically we would call these lamellae, um, but I'm gonna to try to avoid jargon as much as possible uh, when I'm talking about um, uh, mushrooms today. Uh, this uh, illustration here is of a bolete, and you can see uh, that it looks like sort of a sponge on the bottom, but those are actually the ends of tubes. Uh, this was munched by some sort of a invertebrate, probably a slug or something like that. And you can see uh, in cross section here that those are indeed tubes and the spores are produced up inside of those tubes. By the way, both with gills and tubes, the key is, uh, is surface area. So having lots of surface area in, on which to produce these spores is uh, selected for uh, in an evolutionary sense. And um, uh, so it works quite well. Uh, by the way, uh, speaking of the evolution of these things, uh, <clears throat> gills evolved, uh, as far as we know, uh, seven different times. So it's a very effective, um, you know, uh, structure, effective technique for having high surface area and producing, um, uh, on which to produce spores. Uh, down here is a, a fungus that has teeth. Um, also, uh, if we look at puffballs or truffles, uh, the spores are produced on the interior of a structure. And then a lot of uh, fruiting bodies just have the spores that are um, on the expo exposed surface, like we would see with a coral fungus or with a cup fungus. All right, now, um, if it's been a long day and you need to take a nap, this is a good time, because I'm gonna talk about the mushroom life cycle. So, uh, if you uh, can stay awake, uh, all good. But if you need a nap, there's a good time. So let me let me start with this on this illustration, talking about the um, uh, the spores. Okay, so here are two spores right here. One with a red dot, one with a blue dot. Those those colored dots represent the nuclei uh, of the cell. And when you look under a microscope and you see the nuclei of a of the of spores, they're not color coded like this. So this this illustration uh, is demonstrating that these are two mating types. Um, now, let me, as an aside, talk a little bit about mating types. Now, for plants and for animals such as ourselves, uh, there are only two mating types, male and female. But with fungi. Uh, there, it, depending upon the species and and the, or the group of species, um, there can be a lot of mating types. There, there are some fungi that have upwards of a hundred different mating types, and so, um, so that really, if you think about that, if you have multiple, more than two mating types, that increases the the possibility of encountering an appropriate mate. So. Uh, you know, if they're both the same mating type, so again, going back to plants and animals, uh, if it's a sperm cell, it's not gonna be able to mate with another sperm cell. It's not gonna be able to, to fertilize with another sperm cell. Uh, and same thing with a ovum or an egg cell. Uh, two egg cells cannot uh, in nature uh, fuse together to create um, Generally, there's some exceptions, you know, science, always exceptions, but for the most part, that doesn't happen. And it's the same thing with, with fungi. If there are two, say, for example, two red cells that 
encounter each other, they're not going to fuse together. Whereas if it's a blue cell or a purple cell or a green cell, or, you know, those are different mating types. Um, okay, so moving on. So these uh, spores can initially germinate into the substrate and they can begin doing their, their work. They can begin absorbing nutrients from the surrounding environment and they can grow and they can um, undergo mitosis, the process of cell division, to create these uh, hyphae, these chains of cylindrical cells. And that can happen for quite a while. Uh, and eventually, uh, the idea is that it will meet uh, uh, some primary mycelium, we call that. The primary mycelium will meet primary mycelium of a different mating type, and then they'll fuse together. This stage we call that cytoplasmic fusion. So it's essentially the fusion of the two cells. But note that as we look at the now secondary mycelium, so now uh, cytoplasmic fusion has happened. Note that uh, each of these cells has both a red nucleus and a blue nucleus, but the nuclei have not fused together. Now, when we look at fertilization of animals or plants, what happens is cytoplasmic fusion is almost immediately followed by nuclear fusion. That happens within minutes of, of the um, cytoplasmic fusion. However, with, um, with most fungi, with that at least the ones that produced mushrooms, and there's other th ways that this can happen in other groups, but nuclear fusion doesn't happen until the fruiting body forms. And this could be years. Um, there are lots of different ways uh, that, um, that fungi utilize their substrates. So for example, if it's a, a, the type of fungus that is a wood rotter, that can take quite a long time for it to, to break down in the, into the substrate and get to the point where a fruiting body is, is produced. But um, nevertheless, uh, and, and by the way, we call that uh, N plus N or dikaryotic. That, that's, that's a, uh, if you break that down, dikaryotic, it means two nuclei. And so you can see throughout this, this, my, this secondary mycelial stage uh, that the nuclei don't fuse. And that happens eventually, again, in the fruiting body at the terminal cell. So I've, I'm indicating here uh, what's called a basidium. And uh, this is a, a terminal cell uh, on a gill or on, in a tube or on the surface of the fruiting body. And then nuclear fusion occurs. And now we have gone from the haploid uh, part of the life cycle to the diploid part of the life cycle. By the way, those two terms, just to remind you from your high school biology, that uh, diploid means that the nucleus has two sets of chromosomes. And in uh, you and I, uh, almost all of our cells are diploid. And haploid means that there's a single set of uh, chromosomes in each nucleus. And in, in uh, both plants and animals, the only cells that are haploid are the gametes, the sperm cells or the ova. Well, it turns out with, with uh, mushrooms that that diploid stage is fleeting, uh, unlike with plants and animals. They uh, almost immediately after nuclear fusion occurs, meiosis occurs. And meiosis is the process which goes from diploid to haploid and results in, uh, with plants and animals, results in uh, gametes. Uh, sorry, that's with animals. With plants and with fungi, it results in spores. And so uh, and there's a, usually a two-step process, uh, two division events uh, in the meiosis, uh, going from a single cell here to uh, two cells and then a second division event resulting in four cells. Um, and then those become spores 
and are released uh, from the fungus. Again, there are some exceptions. Uh, some of you may know that the, uh, you know, the, the mushroom that you buy in the store, uh, button mushroom, uh, is, is uh, the scientific name is Agaricus bisporus. Uh, and what that means is that there's only a single division event that results in two spores instead of four spores. And uh, conversely, uh, chanterelles um, actually have a third division event and they result, that results in eight spores uh, on their basidia. All right, okay, wake up. Time, your nap is over. All right, so let's, for the next segment of my talk, I wanna talk about the, uh, the roles that fungi play in the environment. And there are three primary roles. That's, uh, that is, um, decom de they're decomposers. There's many of them that are decomposers. So these are, uh, are fungi that break down organic material. There are some organisms that form mutualistic symbioses with fungi. We'll talk about that. And then finally, there are fungi that are pathogens and that form, uh, that create, cause diseases in plants and other organisms. All right, so let's start off talking a little bit about fungi as decomposers. Isn't this a beauty, by the way? This is, uh, um, uh, Gymnopolis uh, luteofolius, and it's uh, really beautiful when it's young. It doesn't look like this when it's uh, uh, expanded out, but it's a really gorgeous mushroom. Anyway, it's an example of a saprotrophic uh, fungus. Uh, <clears throat> that term sapro, uh, saprotrophic refers to, uh, we can break that wor word into two parts, sapro meaning dead and trophic meaning uh, how it eats. Uh, and it turns out that that um, the planet is really um, grateful to, or should be anyway, grateful to fungi because it is a primary decomposer uh, in many environments. It turns out that in uh, in uh, grasslands and uh, in a typical compost pile, about half of the microbial biomass, and and by that I mean um, basically fungi and bacteria, about half of the microbial biomass in those um, systems uh, is fungal. Um, and then if we look in forests, it can be up to 90% of the microbial biomass uh, could be um, fungal in nature. And so it's super important in terms of, of uh, decomposition. Um, now this also, this, uh, you know, in practicality for, if you're out hiking in the woods, uh, most of the saprotrophic fungi are either, um, uh, litter decomposers. Uh, so they're growing on the leaves or the, uh, the fallen branches and things like that, or they're ligniculous, which literally means, uh, wood lovers. And so they're growing on logs or something like that. So uh, these photographs here, you can see a troop of, of uh, fungi. Uh, these are all fruiting bodies from the same mycelial mass. So it's one individual essentially uh, producing all these fruiting bodies in this uh, uh, these wood chips. Um, and then here is a wild uh, oyster mushroom uh, growing on an oak log uh, in the woods somewhere locally. A second uh, role that fungi can play are uh, mutualistic uh, symbioses. And by the way, this is, uh, this is our coastal portini, um, Boletus sedulus complex, uh, very delicious uh, edible mushroom. And uh, uh, portini uh, is a group of, in the group of fungi that are mycorrhizal. Uh, Mycorrhizal, if we take that word and break it down, and by the way, that's not a misprint. There are two R's in the word mycorrhizal. Um, myco meaning fungi, rhizal meaning root. And so these are relationships between a fungus and a plant that occur at the roots. Um, it turns out that over 90% of all plant species 
have a, a mycorrhizal relationship with a fungus. Uh, now there are two kinds of uh, oh, actually, before I get to the to the two different types, uh, I just want to say that uh, that the mutualistic aspect of it is uh, that the the plants uh, provide carbon compounds, photosynthates, basically, uh, to the fungi, and the fungi can convert other nutrients, um, uh, other soil nutrients such as nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, uh, for for the um, the plant to to use in usable forms for them. And then some mycorrhizae also are involved with um, enhancing water uptake. Uh, so, uh, but that was the last uh, topic, last uh, uh, talk that I gave to uh, CMPS. Um, so there are two kinds. Uh, one is uh, called arbuscular mycorrhizae, arbuscular meaning tree-like. And, uh, the green part here, this is these are the cortical cells of, uh, of a plant. And our muscular mycorrhizae um, penetrate into the cell wall, but they don't penetrate the cell membrane. And the cell membrane wraps around these, these this highly branched structures called, called arbuscules. And that's where the nutrient uh, exchange occurs. Again, carbon compounds going to the fungus and other um, micronutrients, so on, going from the fungus to the, to the plant uh, in the roots. Down here, we have a, uh, a light um, a dissecting microscope photograph of um, what's called ectomycorrhizae. Uh, and what we're seeing there is uh, our, uh, the, the mycelium of the fungus is wrapping, has wrapped itself around the, the root tips of the plant. And they form these, uh, sw they look like swollen root tips, but they're basically, it's um, a mycelium that's wrapped around it. I kind of think of it like a, like a corn dog uh, with the hot dog being the root tip and the, the corn meal wrapped around that hot dog being the, the fungal material, the mycelium um, that is wrapped around it. Um, I was just reading about a uh, that there is a kind of a glycoprotein. So glyco meaning carbohydrate, protein obviously. Uh, it's a, a combination of a carbohydrate protein uh, structure. They don't know exactly what it's how it's uh, constructed, but it's called glomalin. And glomalin they think is what holds soil together. Uh, they know that if they remove the glomalin, that the soil basically falls apart. It doesn't hold together. It doesn't stick together. And they think that it's associated with uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae. Um, uh, there's some controversy about that. Uh, but if if that's the case, since, it's a, since it has a carbohydrate component, much of the carbon uh, that is produced by plants uh, especially those that have this relationship. And again, it's vast majority of all plants um, that that glomalin, glomalin is um, uh, sequestering carbon. And so having, uh, you know, making sure that there's plenty of this, this kind of a fungus in the soil is, is actually going to be beneficial with uh, uh, helping to ameliorate uh, climate change. All right. Uh, by the way, there are lots of edible and poisonous uh, fungi that are mycorrhizal. Uh, this is this is another Porcini species. This one is uh, found in the Rocky Mountains. I, I forget the specific epithet of this one, but it's a monster and it is very good, delicious. This is uh, a white chanterelle. Chanterelles are mycorrhizal. Uh, this one here is a deadly amanita called uh, Amanita bisporagina. Uh, the uh, destroying angel is a common name for that one. And then this this here is Matsutake, uh, which is highly sought after as a uh, edible mushroom, uh, particularly in Japan. Um, but it's very good, uh, very tasty with rice, uh, rice dishes. Anyway, these are all mycorrhizal um, mushrooms. Now it turns out that uh, that lichens are another, 
frequently considered to be another um, uh, mutualistic relationship between a fungus and in this case, either an alga or a cyanobacterium. The photobiont, and this is a, a term uh, that um, typifies the, uh, the alga or the cyanobacterium, um, provides photosynthates, very, very similar to the way mycorrhizae work. And then the mycobiont uh, provides a distinctive home for the photobiont. Uh, so it allows the, the alga or the cyanobacterium to live in a place where it otherwise wouldn't be able to. Um, now, there are some um, there are some people that that uh, object to the to the concept that this is a mutualistic relationship. Um, the reason being is that the uh, the photobiont can actually live without the mycobiont. So the the there and there are not very many alga species or cyanobacteria. I think there's less than less than twenty species of alga or cyanobacterium that are involved with lichens, um, they can live just fine without the fungus as long as there's uh, they're in an aquatic environment, right? Moist environment. However, the mycobionts need to have uh, the photobiont and they cannot live without uh, uh, said photobiont. Um, this illustration down here is a micrograph uh, that's been stained the red and sort of off, the sort of pinkish um, structures, those are the hyphae of the, uh, of the fungus. And then the green blobs here, those are the masses of algae uh, or cyanobacteria that are uh, embedded in the fungal matrix uh, of the lichen. And then there's a lot of fungi that are parasites. This photograph, by the way, is of a, a species of honey mushroom that grows on uh, on willows. I took this photograph at Anya Nuevo uh, on the, the willows out by the elephant seals there. Uh, and um, uh, honey mushrooms are an example of a parasitic uh, fungus. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Dutch elm disease, uh, chestnut blight, those are both of fungal diseases that have uh, changed the way that that the eastern United States looks. Uh, there's been a lot of work on these to try to find uh, 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 elms and chestnuts that are resistant to these fungi, and they're actually being pretty successful, especially uh, with the uh, elm. I think that with the elms, they've been very successful at basically trying to find uh, the genes that are that help to resist the fungi. It, it turns out that with these fungi that that are parasitic, there tend to be a lot of genes, some multiple genes that are involved with uh, the susceptibility of the um, trees to um, uh, to the fungi. So, trying to find it, it's taken like thirty years, I think, to to finally work out the uh, the elm. Um, uh, uh, resistance, uh, the, the suite of genes that are resistant to the disease. By the way, I have a Dutch friend and she wants me to tell you that uh, the fungus did not come from Holland. It uh, was actually first identified by Dutch uh, scientists. So uh, don't blame the Dutch on, the, on, the, um, on this disease. Uh, closer to home, we have pine pitch canker. Uh, the uh, genus Fusarium, uh, and it is uh, devastating the Monterey pines. Uh, there is a lot of work also with Monterey pines trying to find uh, resistant uh, um, uh, lineages of Monterey pines. Turns out Monterey pine is a, is a huge uh, economic um, tree. Uh, it's planted in gigantic pop, uh, plantations in uh, Chile and in um, uh, I believe in Australia. Um, and so since there's so much money that comes from Monterey pine plantations, they were working hard to try to figure out how to, uh, uh, um, how to, how they can, uh, they, the Monterey pine industry can basically survive uh, 
fusarium uh, infections. Uh, and then in the lower uh, right corner here is a um, another uh, species of uh, honey mushroom. Uh, honey mushrooms, by the way, is one of the, they're the one of the few um, fungal parasites that make mushrooms, and they are edible. Uh, they're called honey mushrooms not because they're sweet, but because they uh, because of the range of colors they have. They all have sort of a brown or an amber color to them. Um, they're they're not highly sought after as an edible, but they but they some people do eat them for sure. And then there's some fungi that parasitize other fungi, in in addition to plants. Uh, so some of you may recognize this. This is a called a lobster mushroom. Uh, it's pretty rare in the Bay Area, although I've seen it in Mendocino County and uh, and and further north. Uh, certainly saw it in Washington uh, State quite a lot. Um, and this is basically a, um, a parasitic fungus, like a mold, that has attacked a, um, a mushroom called uh, in the genus Russula. And the Russula species that it, it tends to attack ha is, uh, has no flavor. It's uh, sort of a ubiquitous, um, nondescript um, Mushroom grows pretty large. It can get pretty pretty big, but when it's attacked by this this orange um, hypomyces fungus, uh, it actually gives the uh, the russula a flavor, and so people will uh, uh, seek out this lobster mushrooms. It doesn't taste like lobster. It looks like lobster, but uh, um, has a, a sort of savory uh, flavor to it, and um, people like. Uh, Basically collected for the for the uh, for the um, their table. Um, another fungus uh, that attacks um, uh, brassicaceae plants um, is this one here. It's called Puccinia, and uh, it causes the plant uh, to uh, elongate, uh, and then. Um, the spores, once it's elongated, it, the spores of the fungus, which are bright yellow, cover the top of the, the plant. And so a passing insect, like this little wasp right there, will see that and say oh, to itself in wasp language, uh, oh, hey, there's a nice little yellow flower down there. I'll go check it out and see if, it's, if it has some uh, nectar. Uh, it turns out that that there is a, a, a sweet exudate. Now, whether that's from the fungus itself or from the phloem of the plant, I'm not really sure. I'll have to look into that a little bit more. But uh, the insects will, the bees or the wasps or whatever, will stick around and they'll they'll um, feed on this uh, sweet exudate that from there as if it were nectar. In the meantime, they get the spores all over their legs, fly away. They'll land perhaps on another one of these plants and sort of spread the spread the spores. So um, it's pretty amazing, um, a mimic flower mimic. There are some fungi that are parasites on animals, or maybe we should call them predators. Uh, a lot of you have heard of the genus uh, Cordyceps. Uh, it's featured in uh, a um, I. I think it's a Netflix or maybe it's one of the other Hulu or something uh, streaming um, program called The Last of Us, I think it was called. Most, uh, I haven't seen it myself, so I can't speak to it uh, personally, but most people I've talked to, my colleagues that I've talked to, uh, uh, think that it's very far, um, far fetched. Uh, but nevertheless, cordyceps is a type of uh, fungus that attacks animals. And in this case here, this is a beetle grub. There's its head, there's the abdomen. And then these things that are sticking out of it are fruiting bodies of the cordyceps that has attacked that. Um, it also is, is uh, featured, cordyceps is featured in a, uh, a nature program um, whereby the, uh, it attacks, there's a species that attacks ants and it causes the ants to climb like up a branch or a, a blade of grass or whatever. 
and then the ant, uh, if it can't go any farther, it clumps its jaws on the plant and dies. And then the cordyceps produces the fruiting bodies and now that are now higher up in the air column than it otherwise would be. And uh, the cycle continues. Uh, this is very cool here too. This is um, a nematode. So it's a round worm, uh, which are very, very abundant in soil. And uh, the little um, uh, strands right here and these loops are uh, a fungus. And the these loops are made of three different cells. And if a if they are stimulated from the inside by the head or the tail, I, I can't tell which is which of a nematode, um, they swell up with water uh, from nearby hyphal cells and they trap the nematode and then eventually grow into the nematode's uh, body. I see you have a, a lot of chat. I'm not sure if I can, for some reason I can't get into the chat, but uh, you know, maybe later we'll take a look at, the, at uh, what people are saying, but pretty interesting stuff. Um, uh, by the way, a lot of nematodes are are uh, bad for plants. They they're uh, crop pests in a lot of cases, and so so there is a possibility of using uh, this uh, these fungi as uh, biocontrol. Speaking of biocontrol, uh, there are currently fungi that are being used for biocontrol. Bio so here, for example, is a weevil that's been attacked uh, by a uh, some sort of a mold specifically for controlling the the weevil because weevils are plant pests. Um, and so that was introduced uh, to control the weevil. And then this is an interesting one. This is a, an acacia that has was introduced to South Africa, uh, acacia uh, saligna, and is an invasive species. And then this uh, these blobs right here are a gall forming fungus. Uh, that um, is very successful at helping to control the uh, the acacia in uh, South Africa. Now, some plants have turned the tables here uh, on these fungi. It turns out that most achlorophyllous plants, and some of you may recommend recognize this. This is a um, monotropa. Uh, uh, sometimes called a uh, ghost pipe. Uh, it's not found in California, but it's pretty common in the eastern uh, and northern um, North America. Uh, and all orchids are mycoheterotrophic epiparasites. And that'll be on the oral exam, uh, at least for some of their life cycle. So, um, so some orchids are achlorophyllous their entire life. So, so ghost orchids, phantom orchids, uh, here in California, we have coral roots. Um, those are achlorophyllous uh, plants. So in other words, they don't have any chlorophyll, they cannot photosynthesize. Um, and um, orchids, there's, but they're, most orchids uh, eventually photo, begin to grow green leaves and so they can photosynthesize. Um, by the way, this orchid is the Dracula orchid, has this beautiful, um, I think they call it the labellum, uh, that is actually a mushroom mimic. Um, and then here's some other examples. So here's some monotropes. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, pine drops, and this is snow plant, which are both uh, monotropaceae. And then here's a rain orchid uh, from the Sierra Nevada. Um, and what happens here is that these plants actually parasitize mycorrhizal fungi. All right, so think about that for just a second. So here's an achlorophyllous plant, cannot produce its own photosynthate sugars. Parasitizes the mycelium of a fungus that is getting its sugars from another plant say a nearby pine tree or a manzanita bush or something like that. So it's a three-way system. And the benefit, the, the benefactor of this system are these achlorophyllous uh, 
monotro monotropaceous or uh, orchid um, plants. Pretty cool. So there's some things that don't quite fit into these nice boxes of um, of, uh, of being a, a decomposer or being a, a micro I mean a mutualist or being a parasite. And so, for example, it turns out that many plants, in fact, most plants have fungi living inside of their leaves, and we call these endophytes. The relationship between uh, this is not fully understood. By the way, uh, if you look at this illustration here, the this was uh, um, stained. Uh, the fun fungal cell walls have been stained uh, dark blue. And the, if you look carefully, you can see uh, the leaf cells in the background here, which are much larger than the hyphae. Um, but that's an endophytic uh, relationship. Now, there are some endophytes that are clearly uh, anti-herbivore. Um, they produce these alkaloids that herbivores um, uh, tend to avoid eating. Um, this is a, um, a research project where uh, you can see very clearly a line. Uh, the, the grass on the, on the right side is um, most, much, mostly dead and patchy and the grass on the left side is rich and full. Turns out that the grass on the left side has endophytes, the grass on the right side does not. And the grass that does not have the endophytes is being attacked by, um, by uh, some sort of a grub, or I, I, uh, I think it's a beetle grub that is attacking the root systems of the grass and causing die off. So, um, but that does that's not true of all endophytes. So, it's not really clear. One of the theories that, that I am a proponent of that makes sense to me is that these fungi are living in the, in the leaves, uh, living leaves, uh, waiting for those leaves to die. And it turns out that with most leaves, uh, they, they do die eventually. So even evergreen plants, uh, if you look underneath a pine tree, for example, you see lots of needles underneath the pine tree, even though they may they keep needles all year round. But the needle the needles fall off, uh, leaves fall off deciduous trees, and so on. And these endophytes now have a leg up, so basically they're sitting there inside of these leaves, biding their time, waiting for the leaves to die, and then they they can once the leaves do fall off and of, of the tree and they die, then the endophyte can take advantage of that, um, new, that food source, basically. All right, and then finally, I wanna wrap this up by talking about mycophagy, okay? And this is where, you know, the, the, the looking at food, uh, uh, fungi as food for animals. This, by the way, it, it, many of you may recognize this. This is a uh, morel. This is in a burn area that up in the Sierra sometime uh, photograph I took a while back. Turns out that many mammals have developed a taste for mushrooms. So here, for example, is a, a Soilus uh, that has uh, very clear tooth marks. Now, I'm not sure if that's rodent or deer or whatever, they're incisor marks. Uh, so some something uh, decided it wanted a, to have uh, Swillis for dinner. Um, and then um, underground uh, fungi, what we call uh, hypogeus fungi, um, they actually have evolved um, to, to be eaten by some sort of a, of a mammal, typically. Uh, so they have strong odors that they uh, emit and animals like this, uh, the squirrel, this is at uh, the Botan San Francisco Botanic Garden, I took this photo. So this squirrel has detected underground, uh, a, uh, in this case, probably a, what's what we call a false truffle. It's not in the genus tuber, but it is an underground hypogeus fungus that emits an odor. The, uh, when the spores are, are ripe and ready to go, the mammal comes along, takes big, uh, you know, digs it up, eats it. The spores travel through the gut 
uh, pooped out somewhere else, there you go, spore dispersal in action. Um, and that's that's how they evolved, basically. There are some arthropods that are exclusively mycophages. So for example, this is a uh, fungus gnat right here. This is a fungus beetle. And then these are little uh, springtails. Um, they're very, very small. Uh, you uh, you need a hand lens to, to see an individual. They're like this, the size of a pen of a sharp pencil point. Um, but a lot of times you'll turn over a mushroom. This has happened to me thousands of times. They turn over a mushroom, and if you look carefully, you see all these little things jumping around. And those are springtails. And they, they have evolved basically to feed on mushrooms, on fruiting bodies. And there actually are some insects that have evolved um, uh, an agricultural uh, relationship with fungi. Uh, leaf cutter ants. A lot of people think, you know, they're, these ants have, are, have uh, cut up these little, you know, they've, they've bit off a piece of leaf and they're, they go in lines down to their tunnel down into their nest and the assumption is that they eat leaves for their um for their food but it turns out they don't they are feeding the leaves to mycelial masses that are that are in their nests and then the ants eat the mycelium so they are actually eating the fungi there are some bark beetles in the genus ambrosia uh, this is a micrograph electron micrograph of a ambrosia beetle uh, so here's the head, thorax, and then the abdomen. Right at the base of the head, right in this area right here, uh, right where the, it attaches to the thorax, they have these little pockets. And uh, they too eat mycelium that are in decaying wood. And uh, they're called bark beetles because they burrow into the bark. They have this fungus that they have brought with them from the previous tree uh, that they were in. And then they basically spread that mycelium around. The mycelium starts eating the wood, and then the the um, the beetles eat uh, uh, the uh, uh, specifically the larvae eat the uh, the mycelium that's in there. But they carry it. Actually, literally have evolved a way to carry it from one tree to another with them as they as they um, spread around. And then finally, let's not forget the uh, biggest mycophage at all. Mark Lockaby. Uh, no, sorry. Sorry, Mark, just teasing. No, humans. Uh, so uh, humans are big eaters of fungi, as we know. This is Mark cooking up some chanterelles. Here's a, a nice basket uh, with some um, uh, manzanita um, lexinums, uh, manzanita boletes, and a nice big uh, juicy um, um, uh, boletus uh, edulis, the, the um, um, portini. Uh, you can barely see it. There's a an am uh, edible amanita, the cocora, co and then most of this basket is taken up with uh, what's called a, um, a cauliflower mushroom. Uh, all very delicious uh, species. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it's been fun. I wish that I had uh, been able to see you all, but um, another time, uh, please introduce yourself if, if we run in, into each other in the field and I'll be happy to, uh, to take uh, questions. Let me see if I can, uh, not sure how I can get to the chat room here. We can do this. Uh, we could do that. Yeah, you should, it seems like you'd be able to see that, but if not, yeah. uh, we can relay. Yeah, usually you click on it and then there's a, you can see it, but I can't. Yeah, they maybe recently if I, did an update. <laughs> uh, let me, let me uh, stop sharing and see if that'll work. Maybe. Nice. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, you got it? Yep. All right. So. That was fantastic. Hi, hi Candace. <laughs> um, so, oh, uh, so are there any fungi that protect plants from Phytophthora? I don't know that that's the case. So you, you'll notice, by the way, I didn't have Phytophthora in my talk. And that's because um, Phytophthora is not a fungus. It's, uh, it's, um, uh, it has um, 
uh, cellulose cell walls as opposed to um, to chitin cell walls, which fungi have chitin and plants and um, Phytophthora um, have um, cellulose. Phytophthora is actually a water mold. It's in. It's related to um, to those organisms. Um, but yeah, I don't know about uh, any fungi that that actually are um, uh, would be helpful with uh, uh, Phytophthora. Uh, the UC IPM statement. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't re remember which one that is. So uh, Robin, you'll need to like uh, kind of uh, fill me in on that. Oh, here we go. Oh, okay. Phytophthora root and crown rot in the gardens. Okay, so yeah, so that's that's what that is about. So again, um, it's not something that uh, that I talked about because it's a different kingdom. <laughs> so, and then some people have asked about more Phytophthora. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, CN, um, for uh, uh, that about, uh, oh, that would be uh, you, Eddie. <laughs> Thanks, or Noreen. Thanks for asking about uh, the Mycological Society. Um, so uh, the Mycological Society, it, let me just put in the chat here um, the uh, website. So this is the Mycological Society of San Francisco, mssf.org. So you can go there and you can um, you can see how to join. Uh, you can see some past uh, uh, newsletters that we have uh, and so on. Uh, we also have a um, we have a uh, uh, an upcoming event. Uh, so December sixteenth is our fungus fair. Uh, now that's a Saturday. Normally it's a Sunday, but this this year is going to be a Saturday. And at least for now, it's uh, uh, scheduled to be at the um, uh, uh, um, there's a church on Franklin um, whose name I forget. First uh, Unitarian. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so it's at that church um, on uh, Saturday the 16th. And so we'd love to see you there. Uh, we also have. Uh, and uh, monthly meetings like the CMPS has as well. And that's the third Tuesday of every month, except for December, because we have the fungus fair and the summer, we don't do it in the summertime. Um, and then, and, and by the way, the upcoming one, which is uh, Thanksgiving week, it's the Tuesday of thank in uh, Thanksgiving week. Uh, that's Christopher Hobbs. Uh, some of you may know Christopher Hobbs. He's a ethnomycologist and very well versed in, um, um, uh, medicinal uses of fungi as well as plants. So, so that'll be very good. It's a hybrid meeting. Uh, we're meeting at the Randall Museum if you want to be in person and you want to sample the mushroom hors d'oeuvres that we have. Uh, and uh, uh, but it's also on Zoom, so you can you can get to that by going to mssf.org. Uh, Robert uh, asked about uh, birds or mammals eating fungi that are poisonous to humans. I I think uh, certainly invertebrates, you know, so we'll see, for example, um, uh, uh, toxic mushrooms that have uh, uh, slugs on them or, uh, or uh, have um, springtails or, um, or so fungus gnats and things like that. Um, not sure about birds or mammals, um, but, um, you know, there certainly are mammals that will eat poisonous plants so I wouldn't be surprised if there are some that would eat, that would be able to eat uh, with impunity uh, toxic uh, mushrooms. But I, I don't know for sure if that, if of those. Uh, just want to say something about mushrooms and, and, um, and how they grow and so on. So, so a mushroom doesn't last very long once it's produced the fruiting body, uh, you know, once the fungus is uh, produce the fruiting body. The fruiting bodies don't last very long, most of the time. There are exceptions like polypores and things like that. But, um, you know, a lot of these don't last long enough to be eaten uh, by um, uh, a vertebrate. 
for example. Uh, yeah. So uh, that it's possible that uh, that indigenous folks uh, all around the world uh, watched mammals in particular to see what they would eat and wouldn't eat. But again, I would not suggest that for you. So, uh, you know, if you see some uh, rodent uh, tooth marks on a, on a fungus, don't assume that it's, <laughs> that it's okay to eat. Same thing with plants, right? Um, okay. Um, let me also really quickly say something about edibility. Um, so, uh, you know, with, it turns out that there are not that many deadly mushrooms. Uh, there's one species that's responsible for most of the deaths in, in the world. It's called death cap uh, as a single species. Uh, so I would say certainly in North America and um, in Europe, and Eurasia, where it's from, where it's native, uh, it's responsible for the vast majority of mushroom deaths. Uh, and it's been introduced, I know, to uh, places like, I, I, I saw it in Thailand, uh, for example. Uh, so it's been introduced around the world and it, it's a single species. Um, and then there's a handful of other species that are also deadly. Um, you compare that to plants, there's a lot of deadly plants that, you know, it's not like one deadly plant. There's a lot of them. So uh, so, it, you know, if you were to like uh, uh, decide to um, play a version of Russian roulette and uh, eat plants at random and eat mushrooms at random, you're much more likely to die from eating a plant at random than a mushroom. Nevertheless, it's not something you want to try because it's a horrible way to go. Both both uh, all the toxins that are involved with plants and fungi. Um, but uh, uh, you want to really learn. Um, not only what the edible, if you want to collect fungi for, for the table, you want to learn what the edible plant looks like, I mean, the edible mushroom looks like, and then you want to learn what the edible, uh, what the uh, toxic lookalikes, um, what their characteristics are. Um, and, and by the way, uh, there are quite a few mushrooms that'll make you sick. May, they won't kill you, but maybe make you wish you were dead. Um, so, so you just have to be careful out there. Uh, and so you need to just do your studying. There, there are no uh, shortcuts. Uh, there's some some old wives tales about, you know, if you cook it with a silver spoon and the silver and the spoon turns black, that's toxic. If it doesn't, it's not toxic. Not a good idea. Uh, so so learn, learn the characteristics. And you can do that best by by going out with people who know what they're doing. So. Well, far out. Thanks so much, JR. It was such a pleasure to hear your presentation and uh, we learned a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you very fact, much. And thanks also for letting us record it because this is one that I could uh, watch several times and learn <laughs> new things. A lot, a lot of new terminology. Yeah, and that'll help with the exam that's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in 2026 or something like that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, Thank really you. appreciate you being here and uh, hope all you all can come back next month. All right. Adios, uh, amigos. Thank you.